By correlating ancient mountain chains between continents, we have learned that Australia was joined to Antarctica for over 500 million years. Not shown is Zealandia, another continental plate to the east and half the size of Australia. Around 300 million years ago, the world's continents came together to form the supercontinent Pangaea. At this time, the Sydney Basin, shown in green, accumulated sediments as the crust sank between two fold belts, shown in purple and blue. These sediments cemented in time to form a column of rocks over five kilometres deep. There are three Triassic layers at the top. The sandstone in the park is the 240 million year old Hawkesbury Sandstone Formation that guards the entrance to Sydney Harbour. It is over 200 metres thick and formed when Australia was near the South Pole and life was still recovering from the end of the Permian extinction that wiped out over 85% of the Earth's species. The Hawkesbury Sandstone is most prominent on the track north from the volcanic crater. Here it is a pure quartz sandstone with thick flat beds each deposited in one event. The sloping lines are called current bedding and indicate the direction of current flow as new layers were deposited as an underwater dune in a river moved forward. You might like to verify from several rocks that this mighty river flowed north. Sandstone overhangs formed shelters for the local Gwigal fire clan of the Darawal tribe that were present at Cook's Landing. The Hawkesbury sandstone soil is thin, infertile, but over millions of years has developed a diverse flora that we should preserve and treasure. You might like to search for some of these. T.W. Edgeworth David was Foundation Professor of Geology at Sydney University and a national hero. In this building, he trained our pioneer geologists. In 1929, geologist E.T. Kenny surveyed the Lagano volcanic neck that formed a conspicuous depression in the Hawkesbury Sandstone Formation. Sandstone hardened by heat outcropped on the south side of the crater and is a quartzite or according to the quarrymen white metal. The intrusion consists of exploded fragmented basalt called a volcanic breccia. At one well he found weathered basalt that may have been part of a dike. 
the breccia formed an east-west ellipse measuring 400 by 200 metres. In the centre of the valley, the volcanic surface was 25 to 55 metres below the crater rim and 35 metres above the river. A sand sheet partly covered the intrusion. The original volcanic rock has been covered by the construction of three soccer fields. So our study will require some detective work. For 70 years, starting with Professor David, Sydney University geology students visited the North Bondi Volcanic Neck and Metamorphose Sandstone Quarry. The volcanic breccia was quarried for road metal as it was harder than steel. The white metal sandstone was used as a building stone. Now the coast is eroded and the intrusion weathered to white clay and brown iron oxide minerals. You can still see the violence of the event in the front of the volcanic neck. David noted that the breccia contained shattered bits of sandstone and shale rock. There is some similarity to these bits in the soil above the Ebert Park soccer buildings. At Bondi, the magma exploded and cooked the sandstone, which was hardened and shrank, forming four-sided columns. We look closely at the Everett Park rocks behind the cricket nets. You will see similar vertical cooling cracks. The old quarry was built by L.C. Russell Jones in 1910 with a jetty, dam, boat sheds and shark net. The rock was drilled by hand and blasted. There was a steam-driven rock crusher, barge and a paddle steamer to transport the white metal to Botany Bay. Jones died in 1912. The buildings demolished and eventually the dam wall collapsed in a flood. Another quarry was started in 1929 near Ponderosa Place. With so much explosive around, it is little wonder that many sandstone boulders in the valley have moved. But how old was the breccia? And what did it look like? Mars are shallow volcanic craters form when hot rising magma hits water producing violent steam explosions and flinging out a tephra. Here are two small recent Mar craters in Victoria and the more famous Mount Gambier Crater Lake in South Australia that erupted through limestone 6,000 years ago. Mar diatreme volcanoes have a carrot-shaped root zone of fragmented material below the Mar crater. Rising magma from a feeder dike hits groundwater, forming the crater and tephra. Further explosions excavate more surface rock, mixing it with rising magma, creating a volcanic breccia, which is useful as road metal. The best example is the Hornsby diatreme, mined for over 40 years. It has three funnel-shaped pipes and the quarriers went down as far as they could. The Everett Park breccia should have looked like this. The fragments of lava are not rounded but blown apart. The bits in this rock include sand, pebbles, sandstone, shale, granite, with the bits up to one metre across and all welded by a darker volcanic glass. But the interesting bits are pieces of coal. The microscopists have extracted spores dating this material. Some spores are Jurassic in age. So Jurassic coals may have dropped up to 800 metres into the vent. A number of white metal sandstones, small diatremes and volcanic dikes litter Sydney and are believed to be Jurassic in age when the dinosaurs roamed. 
but how about a radiometric age? The prospect dolerite intrusion did not reach the surface. It was capped by shale and spread out like a bird bath. Its blue metal supplied Sydney for 180 years. And its age? 168 million years. In the Jurassic, the Pangaea continents were splitting apart by forming rift valleys that widened to deep oceans. Australia had two rifts to come. The first to split off Zealandia, forming the Tasman Sea, and the second to rift from Antarctica, forming the Great Southern Ocean. The rising Jurassic magmas under Sydney were a prelude to the Zealandia rift. Here is Zealandia in mauve, 20 million years later in the Cretaceous. Then rifting began. Between 80 and 50 million years ago, the Tasman Sea formed and most of Zealandia disappeared beneath the waves. Ebert Park has seen lots of changes. The rainforest area descends to the south of the park with a bubbly creek, rich damp soils and a variety of native ferns including delicate maiden hair. Many old forest giants have been logged, weeds are invading and bushland cleared. At least the mangrove wetlands have been preserved and are a valuable fish nursery. Below the sports fools, Webb's Pond has been built in honour of Ernie Webb whose market garden replaced Russell Jones's orchard. There are problems. High phosphorus nutrient runoff has led to the uncontrolled growth of duckweed, a floating plant that grows mad in summer and dies off in winter forming black organic compost that rots. Ducks eat it and it is not poisonous like blue-green algae. The environmental scientists have built a wetland upstream consisting of grasses and bushes in order to absorb the phosphorus nutrients. The water emerging from the ground from this spring contains iron chemicals processed by bacteria that thrived without oxygen. When the water hits the air, new iron bacteria form a slimy mess as they precipitate brown iron oxide. The casuarina trees seem to tolerate it. These are a few animals that may inhabit the park. You might like to see how many you can find, what they eat and what may endanger them.